Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the July 2023 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of On the Significance of Militant Materialism by Lenin from 1922. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe, and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialismforall. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. I apologize if there's a little more background noise than usual, or if this recording has an odd tone to it. It's summer, and I have an AC on. So this piece was written 12 March 1922. This was after the Russian Revolution. And it was first published in Pod Zanominem Marxisma No. 3, published according to that text. The source is Lenin's Collected Works, Progress Publishers, Moscow, Volume 33, 1972. Translated by David Skversky and George Hanna. HTML transcription and markup by David Walters, Brian Baggins, and R. Cymbala. And it's in the Lenin Internet Archive within the Marxists Internet Archive, marxists.org. Thanks as usual to MIA for hosting this and thousands of other free Marxist texts. Let's begin. Comrade Trotsky has already said everything necessary, and said it very well, about the general purposes of Pod Zanominem Marxisma in issues number one and two of that journal. I should like to deal with certain questions that more closely define the content and program of the work which its editors have set forth in the introductory statement in this issue. This statement says that not all those gathered round the journal Pods Nominem Marxisma are communists, but that they are all consistent materialists. I think that this alliance of communists and non-communists is absolutely essential and correctly defines the purposes of the journal. One of the biggest and most dangerous mistakes made by communists, as generally by revolutionaries who have successfully accomplished the beginning of a great revolution, is the idea that a revolution can be made by revolutionaries alone. On the contrary, to be successful, all serious revolutionary work requires that the idea that revolutionaries are capable of playing the part only of the vanguard of the truly virile and advanced class must be understood and translated into action. A vanguard performs its task as vanguard, only when it is able to avoid being isolated from the mass of the people it leads, and is able really to lead the whole mass forward. Without an alliance with non-communists in the most diverse spheres of activity, there can be no question of any successful communist construction. Quick comment here about the term vanguard and also the term mass. The vanguard is a relative term. It just refers to the most class-conscious portion of the working class. So in any working class, you have a spectrum of class consciousness. You have people who are very backward and who basically just believe and lap up everything that the bourgeoisie tells them. Then you have people who are more critical, more skeptical, more aware of their own class position within the system, and more aware of their own class interests, and so on, up to the vanguard. The people who are, you know, accomplished labor leaders, people who have devoted their lives to studying economics and history and philosophy and so on. So the vanguard, again, is just that tip of the spear, the most class conscious, most historically literate, etc., portion of the working class. And class consciousness can be raised in a couple of different ways. There is book study, which is important. No matter how active you are, you have to inform it with history and theory, and then vice versa, because this is a scientific process. And, you know, let's say you were doing chemistry. You wouldn't just do experiments winging it. You would also study all of the scientists and experimenters who had come before, because you don't need to reinvent the wheel. But then also in terms of your personal consciousness, being engaged in struggle, whether it's a fight for a tenants union or a labor union or whatever, that kind of direct firsthand experience can really open your eyes and change you. And then all of that theory that you read and history comes alive, you can relate to it, and so on back and forth. It's a dialectical relationship between theory and practice. Anyway, the vanguard, like I said, is a relative term, and the quality of the vanguard reflects the overall quality of struggle of the working class. Better, more militant, more dedicated, more studied overall struggle is going to yield a better vanguard and a higher baseline of class consciousness in the working class. So right now, in the United States, for example, we have seen the labor movement, which is the basis really of any socialist effort, declining over the last 50 years to really just dwindling down to single digits percentage union density in the private sector. And it's now starting, just for the last few years, 
there has been a uh, an uptick in union activity. That's crucial. We need to have that happen. Otherwise, all talk of socialism is really just empty words. But anyway, pushing back on this concept that the vanguard is some kind of elitist thing, this is a concept often promoted by anarchists who are anti-quote vanguardist. The vanguard is just a fact that, you know, not everyone has the same level of class consciousness. And as you can hear in this piece, even in what anarchists might call a, quote, vanguardist line of thinking, there is a clear recognition that the vanguard can't just do things on its own. It's leading the masses. The masses ultimately decide. The rest of the working class are not just puppets of the vanguard. That's a ridiculous concept. So if you see this out in the wild, as you may if you spend time on left social media, do push back on it. It's important. Okay, continuing. This also applies to the defense of materialism and Marxism, which has been undertaken by Pod Znamenem Marxisma. Fortunately, the main trends of advanced social thinking in Russia have a solid materialist tradition. Apart from G.V. Plekhanov, it will be enough to mention Chernyshevsky, from whom the modern Narodniks, the popular socialists, socialist revolutionaries or SRs, populists, etc., have frequently retreated in quest of fashionable reactionary philosophical doctrines, captivated by the tinsel of the so-called last word in European science, and unable to discern beneath this tinsel some variety of servility to the bourgeoisie, to bourgeois prejudice and bourgeois reaction. At any rate, in Russia we still have, and shall undoubtedly have for a fairly long time to come, materialists from the non-communist camp, and it is our absolute duty to enlist all adherents of consistent and militant materialism in the joint work of combating philosophical reaction and the philosophical prejudices of so-called educated society. Dietzgen Sr., not to be confused with his writer son, who was as pretentious as he was unsuccessful, correctly, aptly, and clearly expressed the fundamental Marxist view of the philosophical trends which prevail in bourgeois countries and enjoy the regard of their scientists and publicists when he said that, in effect, the professors of philosophy in modern society are, in the majority of cases, nothing but graduated flunkies of clericalism. Our Russian intellectuals, who, like their brethren in all other countries, are fond of thinking themselves advanced, are very much averse to shifting the question to the level of the opinion expressed in Dietzkin's words. But they are averse to it because they cannot look the truth in the face. One only has to give a little thought to the governmental and also the general economic, social, and every other kind of dependence of modern educated people on the ruling bourgeoisie to realize that Dietzkin's scathing description was absolutely true. One has only to recall the vast majority of the fashionable philosophical trends that arise so frequently in European countries, beginning, for example, with those connected with the discovery of radium and ending with those which are now seeking to clutch at the skirts of Einstein, to gain an idea of the connection between the class interests and the class position of the bourgeoisie and its support of all forms of religion on the one hand and the ideological content of the fashionable philosophical trends on the other. It will be seen from the above that a journal that sets out to be a militant materialist organ must be primarily a militant organ in the sense of unflinchingly exposing and indicting all modern, quote, graduated flunkies of clericalism, irrespective of whether they act as representatives of official science or as freelances calling themselves democratic left or ideologically socialist publicists. In the second place, such a journal must be a militant atheist organ, we have departments, or at least state institutions, which are in charge of this work. But the work is being carried on with extreme apathy, and very unsatisfactorily, and is apparently suffering from the general conditions of our truly Russian, even though Soviet, bureaucratic ways. It is therefore highly essential that, in addition to the work of these state institutions, and in order to improve and infuse life into that work, a journal which sets out to propagandize militant materialism must carry on untiring atheist propaganda and an untiring atheist fight. The literature on the subject in all languages should be carefully followed, and everything at all valuable in this sphere should be translated or at least reviewed. Comment here, what does Lenin mean when he says that the work is being carried on with extreme apathy and is apparently suffering from the general conditions of our truly Russian, even though Soviet, bureaucratic ways? This is post-revolution, right? It's 1922. Why isn't everything magically different? Well, as has been expressed since the beginning of Marxism, it's to be understood that 
in the first few years, particularly after a revolution, things don't all change overnight. There are definitely state policies which can be changed with the stroke of a pen, really immediately following the seizure of state power by revolutionaries. But there are other factors that are going to carry over and will take time to uproot, cultural factors and other things. These are not so quick to change and they can't just all be changed by decree overnight. Again, some policies can be. Expropriations can be carried out. Guards can be posted to protect liberated property, etc. However, the new socialist society is going to be stamped with characteristics from its parent society, capitalism. And it can take years, decades, even sometimes generations to uproot some of those old hallmarks, traits, and again cultural assumptions which were impressed upon people in the old society. Here, though, Lenin is calling for immediate attention to a change in the culture, a conscious change in the culture within these particular departments. Okay, continuing. Engels long ago advised the contemporary leaders of the proletariat to translate the militant atheist literature of the late 18th century for mass distribution among the people. We have not done this up to the present. To our shame be it said, this is one of the numerous proofs that it is much easier to seize power in a revolutionary epoch than to know how to use this power properly. Our apathy, inactivity, and incompetence are sometimes excused on all sorts of lofty grounds, as, for example, that the old atheist literature of the 18th century is antiquated, unscientific, naive, etc. There's nothing worse than such pseudo-scientific sophistry, which serves as a screen either for pedantry or for a complete misunderstanding of Marxism. There is, of course, much that is unscientific and naive in the atheist writings of the 18th century revolutionaries, but nobody prevents the publishers of these writings from abridging them and providing them with brief postscripts, pointing out the progress made by mankind in the scientific criticism of religions since the end of the 18th century, mentioning the latest writings on the subject and so forth. It would be the biggest and most grievous mistake a Marxist could make to think that the millions of the people, especially the peasants and artisans, who have been condemned by all modern society to darkness, ignorance, and superstitions, can extricate themselves from this darkness only along the straight line of a purely Marxist education. These masses should be supplied with the most varied atheist propaganda material. They should be made familiar with facts from the most diverse spheres of life. They should be approached in every possible way, so as to interest them, rouse them from their religious torpor, stir them from the most varied angles and by the most varied methods, and so forth. Comment. So, Lenin clearly here is calling for as much atheist propaganda to be presented to the masses as possible. And that's a very good idea. Now, where I thought that there was some contradiction earlier, and I was just mentioning this in a recent commentary at the end of Socialism in the Churches by Luxembourg, is that in questions of the party, you know, there are different policies with regard to religion for the general population, the general society, that is the state, and for the party. So it's the communist position, the Marxist position, that with regard to the state, religion should be a private personal matter. That is complete separation of church and state, anti-clericalism, no privileges, no money, whatever, to religious institutions, combined with materialistic, scientific propaganda put out by the state. As discussed here, if people want to have their inner convictions, that's fine, but it's not going to be supported in any way by the state. Hence the policy of making religion a purely personal private matter. But that's in regard to the state. In regard to the party, the same is not true. Marxism is scientific and materialistic and against all kinds of religious illusions, superstition, and idealism. These only cloud people's understanding of why things happen in this world. It's logically inconsistent to believe both that there are material causes for things and also that immaterial beings actually rule the world. Marx, in the introduction to a contribution to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, found that really the only positive thing he could say about religion is that it may somewhat alleviate the feelings of suffering of the oppressed and exploited, but even this he qualified by saying that it does so in a false way, as the opium of the people. Obviously, opium does not get to the symptoms, only some of the feelings. The entire rest of the piece, and the main thrust of the piece overall, is that people must dig deeper than that, confront the pain that they're experiencing as a result of class society, replace religious illusion with philosophy and reason within themselves, 
as this was the only way that people would really be able to summon the requisite strength and courage to face down this system and do a thoroughgoing revolution which could actually uproot all of class society. Now, Lenin makes the point in discussing policies of the party toward religion in pieces like Socialism and Religion from 1905 or the attitude of the Workers' Party to religion in 1909 that by and large every member of the Marxist Party, Communist Party, Social Democratic Party as they called it at that time was avowedly atheist. He did also tackle the question of should the party allow in any members who aren't, who profess religious beliefs. And basically, I found that there was a little bit of waffling here, and it was like, yes, as long as they're not too loud about it and they do agree to promote a materialist program as part of the work of the party and to accept the Marxist worldview. But accepting the Marxist worldview does mean giving up those religious illusions in order to, as Marx said, pluck the real flower instead of the illusory one. What's the grace period? We don't know. I guess it's one of those you'll know it when you see it kind of things if people are trying to preach religion within the party and so on. Lenin also makes the point that the party should go out of its way not to offend religious sensibilities. And this to me is where you start getting into really difficult and potentially contradictory waters because why? The inherent touchiness of the subject. I mean in the United States today there's a creationist museum, a multi-million dollar project in real life, occupying real territory, that is just devoted to miseducating people about science, geology, paleontology, etc. Any dedicated materialist cannot mention such a thing without also conveying at least some of the extreme scorn such a thing deserves. But not all religious propaganda is on the level of a creationist museum. Okay, so other lighter forms of such propaganda may deserve a slightly lesser amount of scorn, ridicule, and mockery. Perhaps not at every last believer, but at least at the people trying to perpetrate such frauds on the public. Now the problem is, they do try to organize the public and draw them into their campaigns. And these reactionaries can get people worked up into such a lather that even the mention of atheism, or of science at all, can be taken as a slight. So how do we vigorously spread atheistic propaganda while taking pains not to offend religious views? I guess it's simply a matter of tone, of not being deliberately obnoxious about it. But, for example, in the United States, there is a cable access show, which is also online, called The Atheist Experience. It's broadcast out of the Deep South, Texas, which is dominated by a very bigoted, chauvinistic form of Christianity. And the way that those people react, it's an offense to them, to their God, that atheists even dare hold their heads up in public and name themselves by name and talk about science and logic and fallacious thinking of the type that humans are unfortunately prone and these kinds of magical thinking result in religious illusions and the embrace of illogic in the place of reason. And they are assaulted show after show by callers attacking them for existing and trying to bring down their positions with all kinds of fallacies which do get dismantled and dismissed, but which seems to rarely result in any change in the thinking, or at least any admission in the change in the thinking on the part of the callers. Another thing that I find interesting is even people who have mostly accepted a materialist worldview still clinging in a desperately needy, emotional way to some kind of mystical, irrational thinking and trying to get some validation for that, some blessing from the atheist panel to say it's acceptable to have this minimal, you know, small amount of magical thinking in my thought process and that's okay, right? And the problem with that is even if you leave, you know, small amounts of loopholes of magical thinking in your thought process, your overall worldview, really kind of um, sinister things can sneak in through that loophole that ultimately are going to undermine your understanding of the world. The problem, again, is tone. The point that I make about the panel being repeatedly hit with the same things every week and people just... Um, Confronting them with a very bold and arrogant ignorance seems to wear on them, and they do snap at the callers, and things get kind of nasty. 
On the one hand, I understand it, because after you've heard the thing 500 times, it gets really old, and there is an extreme intolerance of atheism, of militant materialism, in that backward society, and they feel the brunt of that, and they experience social consequences of that, and it's unpleasant. But I guess that coming back around here to the text, I will continue the reading at some point here, um, I guess this is why the alliance of non-communist materialists and communist materialists needs to happen. Because without the seizing of power in society, which you're not going to do really, I mean, it is on the one hand uh, the task of the bourgeois democracy to eliminate clericalism, at least to a point, although we know that they do tend to anchor in a certain amount of reaction to uh, protect against socialism, and that's exactly what you see in the United States, for example. But you, you're never going to complete that process entirely and be able to move on into a purely rationalistic society where science is actually given free reign and people don't grow up socialized into illusory, fantastical notions about the world and human behavior and society and so on. So you need socialism to actually achieve that. It's just not going to really happen in capitalism. This is an overall mistake of the 2000s new atheist movement, which is tinged with all kinds of reactionary undertones. And also popularized the very sort of obnoxious presentation of atheism, which on the one hand, for people who are really sick and tired of religion, particularly people who maybe did grow up in a more conservative pocket of society that was more religious, really shoved it down your throat, maybe you're tired of all the hypocrisy, I get it, you're angry. On the other hand, I think that some of the obnoxiousness comes from reaching the limits of what you can do within bourgeois civil society, of just debating it out. You're never going to debate it out, because the bourgeois class rule requires that they keep a certain amount of this shit on hand to fling at anybody trying to move beyond capitalism. And so you can end up just becoming shriller and shriller and shriller, but still being up against billions of dollars in religious propaganda. And in some ways, you know, maybe some people who are questioning and becoming aware of the hypocrisy and so on do become influenced by you. And they find a way to, you know, confront it in their own life, whether it's a family member that is pushing some hypocritical religion on them or so on. And, you know, that has some personally liberating effect. But what we need here is a political movement. And coming back to Lenin, quote, These masses should be supplied with the most varied atheistic propaganda material. They should be made familiar with facts from the most diverse spheres of life, should be approached in every possible way so as to interest them, rouse them from their religious torpor, stir them from the most varied angles and by the most varied methods, and so forth. So... There is a movement for political power here in socialism and communism, which is clearly atheistic. We do not want to play into people's religious beliefs. We, in fact, want to bring people into a post-religious society, undermining all of the foundations of the misery and suffering, which even made something like that appealing in the first place. But beyond that, also teaching self-awareness and neurobiology that actually causes some of our temptation to fall into fallacious magical thinking. Science and materialism here always being the key. Scientific socialism. So there is a tension today between how do you not go out of your way to offend people while still tactfully dealing with the fact that many people take it as an offense even to mention the idea that religion might, hey, not be true, and maybe there's something better that we can devote more of our thinking to. Well, as socialists, we confront this all the time with questions of people who have invested in nationalism, in sexism, continuing to put out anti-nationalist propaganda, anti-sexist propaganda, and so on. Winning to our side in the process, the more advanced masses who are more ready to accept it offhand. And of course, yes, it's going to set off the more backward people who just lap up reactionary propaganda anti-intellectualism, and so on. What we would call basically the foundations of fascism in an advanced capitalist society, put there by the rulers of this advanced capitalist or imperialist society in order to create a population basically supportive of imperialism, or at least who can't effectively fight imperialism. So what is ultimately this balance of provocation, rousing and stirring people, 
pro-materialist agitation, in other words, that also goes out of its way not to offend religious sensibilities. I think it's a very fine line to walk. I think we should be forgiving of those sincere materialists and socialists who fall afoul of it, as long as we continue to try to refine the tone, refine the propaganda, refine the agitation efforts, so that it becomes more effective with less and less conflict as we build our numbers. Eventually there will be a revolutionary conflict out of all of this as the forces of fascism come down on a growing socialist, materialist, atheist movement. First with disinformation and slander, then with violence and actual police repression and so on. But if we have the numbers, which building those numbers is the point of this whole thing, then we will win in the end, despite their efforts. All right. I think, at least for me, I have advanced some of my own inner dialogue on that. So let's continue. The keen, vivacious, and talented writings of the old 18th century atheists wittily and openly attack the prevailing clericalism and will very often prove a thousand times more suitable for arousing people from their religious torpor than the dull and dry paraphrases of Marxism, almost completely unillustrated by skillfully selected facts, which predominate in our literature, and which, it is no use hiding the fact, frequently distort Marxism. We have translations of all the major works of Marx and Engels. There are absolutely no grounds for fearing that the old atheism and old materialism will remain unsupplemented by the corrections introduced by Marx and Engels. The most important thing, and it is this that is most frequently overlooked by those of our communists who are supposedly Marxists, but who in fact mutilate Marxism, is to know how to awaken in the still undeveloped masses an intelligent attitude toward religious questions and an intelligent criticism of religions. On the other hand, Take a glance at modern scientific critics of religion. These educated bourgeois writers almost invariably supplement their own refutations of religious superstitions with arguments which immediately expose them as ideological slaves of the bourgeoisie, as graduated flunkies of clericalism. Two examples. Professor R. Y. Whipper, published in 1918, a little book entitled Vosnik Noveni Christianstva, The Origin of Christianity. In his account of the principal results of modern science, the author not only refrains from combating the superstitions and deceptions which are the weapons of the church as a political organization, not only evades these questions, but makes the simply ridiculous and most reactionary claim that he is above both, quote, extremes, the idealist and the materialist. This is toadying to the ruling bourgeoisie, which all over the world devotes to the support of religion hundreds of millions of rubles from the profits squeezed out of the working people. The well-known German scientist, Arthur Drews, while refuting religious superstitions and fables in his book, De Christus Mitta, The Christ Myth, and while showing that Christ never existed, at the end of the book declares in favor of religion, albeit a renovated, purified, and more subtle religion, one that would be capable of withstanding, quote, the daily growing naturalist torrent. Here we have an outspoken and deliberate reactionary who is openly helping the exploiters to replace their old, decayed religious superstitions by new, more odious and vile superstitions. This does not mean that Druze should not be translated. It means that while in a certain measure effecting an alliance with the progressive section of the bourgeoisie, communists and all consistent materialists should unflinchingly expose that section when it's guilty of reaction. It means that to shun an alliance with the representatives of the bourgeoisie of the 18th century, i.e. the period when it was revolutionary, would be to betray Marxism and materialism, for a, quote, alliance with the Druzes, in one form or another, and in one degree or another, is essential for our struggle against the predominating religious obscurantists. Okay, so comment here. This is an important thing. Lenin is saying quite clearly that, as is well known in Marxist theory, the bourgeoisie early on, are freedom fighters that help to overthrow feudalism. However, at some point, they become more interested in just entrenching their system, which is, of course, based on the exploitation and proletarianization of the population. As I mentioned before, there is a kind of bourgeois or capitalist anti-clericalism, which does seek to uproot at least enough of the church's power to make room for the bourgeoisie, though they tend not to entirely overthrow it, because why? They need to keep it around to use it as a weapon against the growing proletariat whom they seek to exploit for as long a period of time as possible. However, those more progressive sections of the bourgeoisie, 
which may be especially prominent in certain periods of capitalist development, do have valuable things to say that should be used by communists. So in certain measure, there should be an alliance with the progressive section of the bourgeoisie. But when that section of the bourgeoisie is also guilty of reaction, which it can also be, then the materialists should unflinchingly expose it. In other words, take the good, leave the bad. This gets a little complicated for the more black and white inclined thinkers, but hopefully most people get it. As Lenin says, this is essential for our struggle against the predominating religious obscurantists. So basically, in this fight against religious obscurantism, take any ally you can get, although also be very quick, unflinching in your criticisms of those bourgeois allies when they are reactionary. Continuing. Pod's nominem Marxisma, which sets out to be an organ of militant materialism, should devote much of its space to atheist propaganda, to reviews of the literature on the subject, and to correcting the immense shortcomings of our governmental work in this field. It is particularly important to utilize books and pamphlets which contain many concrete facts and comparisons showing how the class interests and class organizations of the modern bourgeoisie are connected with the organizations of religious institutions and religious propaganda. All material relating to the United States of America, where the official state connection between religion and capital is less manifest, is extremely important. But on the other hand, it becomes all the clearer to us that so-called modern democracy, which the Mensheviks, the socialist revolutionaries, partly also the anarchists, etc., so unreasonably worship, socialist revolutionaries here not being socialists who are revolutionary, but the populist peasant representing party in Russia, is nothing but the freedom to preach whatever is to the advantage of the bourgeoisie, to preach namely the most reactionary ideas, religion, obscurantism, defense of the exploiters, etc. One would like to hope that a journal which sets out to be a militant materialist organ will provide our reading public with reviews of atheist literature, showing for which circle of readers any particular writing might be suitable and in what respect, and mentioning what literature has been published in our country, only decent translations should be given notice, and there are not so many, and what is still to be published. In addition to the alliance with consistent materialists who do not belong to the Communist Party, of no less and perhaps even of more importance for the work which militant materialism should perform is an alliance with those modern natural scientists who incline toward materialism and are not afraid to defend and preach it as against the modish philosophical wanderings into idealism and skepticism which are prevalent in so-called educated society. The article by A. Timiryazev on Einstein's theory of relativity, published in Pod's Anomenem Marxisma No. 1 and 2, permits us to hope that the journal will succeed in effecting this second alliance too. Comment, Einstein did indeed become a very ardent supporter of socialism. You can see why socialism here at Socialism for All as an audiobook. Continuing, greater attention should be paid to this alliance. It should be remembered that the sharp upheaval which modern natural science is undergoing very often gives rise to reactionary philosophical schools and minor schools, trends and minor trends. Unless, therefore, the problems raised by the recent revolution in natural science are followed, and unless natural scientists are enlisted in the work of a philosophical journal, militant materialism can be neither militant nor materialism. Tamiryazev was obliged to observe in the first issue of the journal that the theory of Einstein, who, according to Tamiryazev, is himself not making any active attack on the foundations of materialism, has already been seized upon by a vast number of bourgeois intellectuals of all countries. It should be noted that this applies not only to Einstein, but to a number, if not to the majority, of the great reformers of natural science since the end of the 19th century. For our attitude towards this phenomenon to be a politically conscious one, it must be realized that no natural science and no materialism can hold its own in the struggle against the onslaught of bourgeois ideas and in the restoration of the bourgeois world outlook, unless it stands on solid philosophical ground. In order to hold his own in the struggle and carry it to a victorious finish, the natural scientist must be a modern materialist, a conscious adherent of the materialism represented by Marx, i.e., he must be a dialectical materialist. In order to attain this aim, the contributors to Pod's Anomenem Marxisma must arrange for the systematic study of Hegelian dialectics from a materialist standpoint, i.e., the dialectics which Marx applied practically in his work Capital and in his historical and political works, and applied so successfully that now, every day of the awakening to life and struggle of new classes in the East, Japan, India, and China, 
i.e. the hundreds of millions of human beings, who form the greater part of the world population and whose historical passivity and historical torpor have hitherto conditioned the stagnation and decay of many advanced European countries. Every day of the awakening to life of new peoples and new classes serves as a fresh confirmation of Marxism. Of course, this study, this interpretation, this propaganda of Hegelian dialectics is extremely difficult and the first experiments in this direction will undoubtedly be accompanied by errors. But only he who never does anything never makes mistakes. Taking as our basis Marx's method of applying materialistically conceived Hegelian dialectics, we can and should elaborate this dialectics from all aspects, print in the journal excerpts from Hegel's principal works, interpret them materialistically, and comment on them with the help of examples of the way Marx applied dialectics, as well as of examples of dialectics in the sphere of economic and political relations, which recent history, especially modern imperialist war and revolution, provides in unusual abundance. In my opinion, the editors and contributors of Pod's Nominem Marxisma should be a kind of society of materialist friends of Hegelian dialectics. Modern natural scientists, if they know how to seek and if we learn to help them, will find in the Hegelian dialectics, materialistically interpreted, a series of answers to the philosophical problems which are being raised by the revolution in natural science and which make the intellectual admirers of bourgeois fashion stumble, quote-unquote, into reaction. Unless it sets itself such a task and systematically fulfills it, materialism cannot be militant materialism. It will not be so much the fighter as the fought, to use an expression of Shchedrin's. Without this, eminent natural scientists will, as often as hitherto, be helpless in making their philosophical deductions and generalizations. For natural science is progressing so fast and is undergoing such a profound revolutionary upheaval in all spheres that it cannot possibly dispense with philosophical deductions. In conclusion, I will cite an example which has nothing to do with philosophy, but does at any rate concern social questions, to which Pod's nominum Marxisma also desires to devote attention. It is an example of the way in which modern pseudoscience actually serves as a vehicle for the grossest and most infamous reactionary views. I was recently sent a copy of Economist No. 1, published by the 11th Department of the Russian Technical Society. The young communist who sent me this journal, he probably had no time to read it, rashly expressed considerable agreement with it. In reality, the journal is, I do not know to what extent deliberately, an organ of the modern feudalists, disguised, of course, under a cloak of science democracy, and so forth. A certain Mr. P. A. Sorokin publishes in this journal an extensive so-called sociological inquiry on the influence of the war. This learned article abounds in learned references to the sociological works of the author and his numerous teachers and colleagues abroad. Here is an example of his learning. On page 83, I read, quote, For every 10,000 marriages in Petrograd, there are now 92.2 divorces, a fantastic figure. Of every 100 annulled marriages, 51.1 had lasted less than one year, 11% less than one month, 22% less than two months, 41% less than three to six months, and only 26% over six months. These figures show that modern legal marriage is a form which conceals what is in effect extramarital sexual intercourse, heavens to Betsy, enabling lovers of, quote, strawberries to satisfy their appetites in a, quote, legal way. Unquote. Both this gentleman and the Russian Technical Society, which publishes this journal and gives space to this kind of talk, no doubt regard themselves as adherents of democracy, and would consider it a great insult to be called what they are in fact, namely, feudalists, reactionaries, graduated flunkies of clericalism. Even the slightest acquaintance with the legislation of bourgeois countries on marriage, divorce, and illegitimate children, and with the actual state of affairs in this field, is enough to show anyone interested in the subject that modern bourgeois democracy, even in all the most democratic bourgeois republics, exhibits a truly feudal attitude in this respect towards women and toward children born out of wedlock. This, of course, does not prevent the Mensheviks, the populist SRs, a part of the anarchists, and all the corresponding parties in the West from shouting about democracy and how it's being violated by the Bolsheviks. But as a matter of fact, the Bolshevik Revolution is the only consistently democratic revolution in respect to such questions as marriage, divorce, and the position of children born out of wedlock. And this is a question which most directly affects the interests of more than half the population in any country. 
Although a large number of bourgeois revolutions preceded it and called themselves democratic, the Bolshevik Revolution was the first and only revolution to wage a resolute struggle in this respect, both against reaction and feudalism and against the usual hypocrisy of the ruling and propertied classes. If 92 divorces for every 10,000 marriages seem to Mr. Sorekin a fantastic figure, one can only suppose that either the author lived and was brought up in a monastery so entirely walled off from life that hardly anyone will believe such a monastery ever existed, nice, or that he is distorting the truth in the interest of reaction in the bourgeoisie. Anybody in the least acquainted with social conditions in bourgeois countries knows that the real number of actual divorces, of course not sanctioned by church and law, is everywhere immeasurably greater. The only difference between Russia and other countries in this respect is that our laws do not sanctify hypocrisy and the debasement of the woman and her child, but openly and in the name of the government declare systematic war on all hypocrisy and all debasement. The Marxist journal will have to wage war also on these modern, quote, educated feudalists. Not a few of them, very likely, are in receipt of government money and are employed by our government to educate our youth, although they are no more fitted for this than notorious perverts are fitted for the post of superintendents of educational establishments for the young. The working class of Russia proved able to win power, but it has not yet learned to utilize it, for otherwise it would have long ago very politely dispatched such teachers and members of learned societies to countries with a bourgeois, quote, democracy. That is the proper place for such feudalists. But it will learn, given the will to learn. March 12, 1922. That's the end of the audiobook. I gave all of my comments before. What do you think? Leave a question or comment below. We'll continue the discussion in the comment section, as always. This also marks the end of our little mini-series in July 2023 on religion. We did, I think, 11 texts, so nice little run of things. We may pick it back up again in the future, but there are other topics to cover, and we're going to move on to those now. Hopefully you've enjoyed it and got something out of it. I know that I did. Otherwise, thanks for listening, and thanks to the patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month or more. Every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful, so I really appreciate that. I believe that communist media should remain non-commercial, so I don't run ads or do sponsorships on this channel. That support is very important. I would be able to make some kind of content, even if nobody supported, I would feel that it's my duty as a member of the proletariat and a class-conscious proletarian to do that, but I wouldn't be able to spend nearly as much time on it without that support. So again, thank you very much to those who do support. Patreon.com slash Socialism for All. If you like this channel, thank me, but also thank a patron because they're really enabling this work in large part. Also, whether you're a patron or not, engagement counts. Like, share, subscribe. All of that helps YouTube to recommend this content to other people. And that's a great indirect way of helping the channel and helping to spread this information and this discourse to more people. There are many working people now in the English-speaking world, and actually even beyond that with the uh, auto-generated captions now, which can be translated into many languages, who are asking questions about the crises of capitalism that we're facing. They may just understand it at first as just bad economic conditions and not really know what's happening. We want to introduce those people to more answers, deeper answers, the roughly 200-year history of socialism and the roughly 175-year history of scientific socialism or Marxism. And again, YouTube recommending this content to new people helps to do that. Finally, remember that the class struggle happens out there in the real world. Online is a great place for agitation, drawing out complaints, elaborating on questions, and also education, following up that agitation with answers about the class struggle class society, class exploitation, and how to fight it, how it's historically been fought, and how we are in a period of bad counter-revolution right now, but can build our numbers back. But again, that building of our numbers back occurs in the real world primarily. So labor union support, starting labor unions, supporting them, spreading news about them, showing up to picket lines with food and asking what they need and just telling the striking workers that you're on their side finding out what else is going on in your area, political parties that are against capitalism, other efforts that may be going on locally to fight some form of local exploitation, find out what's going on in your area, network, get to know people, let them get to know you, carefully of course, 
but confidently. After all, we can't change the U.S. left or influence it without at least understanding it and being in contact with it. But again, right now, I think that the focus, as I mentioned earlier, is really on rebuilding the labor movement. So any organizations that you see actively engaged in that in a militant way, critical to support and to see if you can give your time to or resources to in some way, because without that, without a militant, organized union movement, there is just no way to actually build the class consciousness and political power needed for socialism, and it's just empty talk without that. But assuming for the moment that that movement will be growing, yes, we also do need people who are well-versed in the revolutionary labor and workers' movements of, again, the last 200, 150 years, who can help to advise and guide that movement as it grows to avoid mistakes, opportunism, all the kinds of things that we've seen, particularly over the last century. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. We can study history and, again, try to learn from past mistakes rather than just making them over and over again the hard way. People sometimes ask me, what kind of parties do you recommend or something? Like I said, you see what's going on in your area, you make that call for yourself. I don't think that any of the parties are strong enough at this point, or recommendable enough, that I can say this one over that one. Um, the only thing I would say, which is not local, is that there is an international group called Politsturm, P-O-L-I-T-S-T-U-R-M, they're based in Russia, Armenia, Ukraine, United States, and other countries. They have an English language YouTube channel, also a website that is in English, and also a Russian-speaking YouTube channel. That's an international Marxist study group, and I personally have been impressed with a lot of the work that I've seen, and I am in contact with some of the members in that organization. So that would be something maybe to check out if you are interested but again, this is up to your judgment and where you think you're going to be effective, and I can't make that call for you. But I am happy to have various dialogues about it within certain limits. Okay, that's it for this video. Thanks. We'll see you in the next video as we plan to pivot into a Rosa Luxemburg miniseries. See you then.